mountain fastness, alternating between the calm, cool whiteness of the sunlit snows and the howling winter winds, or shimmering in the midsummer heat, providing the famous lines of poet Banjo Patterson. Hi guys, Scott here from Outlaw Garage. We're here with Glenn today, which is, with, look, potentially the strangest, slowest, most traveled Porsche we've ever seen. So, um, welcome to the Hamilton's Delivered Snow Track. This has to be the strangest Porsche I've ever seen. So here we are, we're with Glenn. I'm not, so, so where do you start? Like, um, how did you come across it? I read an article in an English magazine years ago about snow tracks. I thought, geez, they're cool. I'd love to have one one day. And that was about as far as it went. And then about five, four and a half years ago, I saw an ad on uh, Facebook on Rusty Rex for a snow track in South Australia. And I was, just thought two grand, I can't, can't go wrong. So I went ahead and bought it. That's pretty much it. I gotta say that this has to be the best two thousand dollars. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I have a, ever seen anybody spend. It really is the gift that keeps on giving. E it's, either it's... for fun, history, um, it, it's it's amazing. So uh, I don't know. Where do you want to start? Do you want to? Yeah, look, um, we'll give you a bit of the history if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in nineteen fifty-nine, I believe. Uh, Norm Hamilton, who had Hamilton Porsche, who there's a good story behind all that as well. He was selling light planes through his dealership, his Porsche dealership in Melbourne, yeah. in St Kilda. The Antarctic, Australian Antarctic Division were not far away and decided they wanted a light plane for, their, for to take down to, to Mawson Station. Yeah. When they went into the Hamilton Porsche dealership, they saw brochures for snow tracks. And on his own bat, Norm Hamilton imported two and demonstrated them for the Antarctic Division and they bought them straight away and took them to Antarctica. So this machine went to Antarctica in the summer of 1960-61 on the, on the Thaladan, which was a Swedish ship. This is made in Sweden, of course. Yeah. And spent about six years down there. And it had a very, very hard life while it was there. That's a long time, yeah. six years down there. That's... Number, there was two, and the first one lasted about 12 months. And that gave them gearbox problems, so they shipped it back to Australia and sold it. But they kept this one. Which but is this is number two, and I Correct. think we'll cover it a little bit more late, but later. But I think you can make out number two there. But there's a, a little bit more history to kind of um, go with it. So we just had a bit of a chat, kind of figuring out how we're going to talk about this because. Um, it's a beast with some history here. So I think we'll go through how it runs and operates first, because it's not your standard snow track exactly. or your standard Generally, Porsche. <laughs> uh, most of them made in Sweden. There's only about 2,100 made between 58 and about 81. And this is number 49 of total production. So it's very early. It's a 58 model. Oh, sorry, 57 to 81 they went from. This yeah. is a 58 model. This is number 49 of total production and it uh they are generally volkswagen powered with volkswagen gearboxes and yeah. a few other bits and pieces got a volkswagen steering wheel volkswagen brakes uh early combi brakes believe it or not and yeah, okay. this one when it was imported into australia through the hamilton porsche dealership uh they retrofitted a porsche 356 industrial engine which is a 1956 engine uh, which was kindly fully restored by alan hamilton himself and uh, I'll pop the bottom. I think we'll have some photos and some video of that, yeah, which we'll we'll see. as well. well so here it. we go. So they operate with a variator steering system, which is all this. It has a Volkswagen steering box and pitman arm. And as you turn the wheel, it only operates when you drive. It can't operate while it's steady. They have a, uh, fixed axles with bevel gears that drive these two variators. Yeah, okay and the chain drive to the front. And as you turn the wheel, the pitman arm changes. Oh, the so the forms. chain drives right to the yeah. front, is it? Yeah. So the industrial engines have single carb instead of dual carbs, a lot yep. of valve springs and more compression, I believe. 
little major yeah features. they do have a little bit more compression mm. so there we go there's the Hamilton signature on the side from it being exactly. restored there's a bit more of the chain linkage down the side there and down so they're that. designed pretty well in that anyone who can drive a car can drive one of these. They have a Volkswagen gearbox which is a reverse pattern, so it's all back to front. Yeah, okay. So no no lever controls like a bulldozer. Uh, it is a steering wheel control, oh. but only when it's moving. You can't change the direction of it. You can't turn the tracks at all while it's static. Yeah, okay. Well, that is what people won't be used to seeing, a 356 engine. In kind the front. of in the front <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that is a little bit of an oddball and then how it's set up as well this breather box which ducts air through the bonnet into the back of the fan shroud was missing and believe it or not i found the only one probably for sale in australia yeah because parts are yeah, just not off the shelf it, are they like i was just about to make one and contacted a bloke who i know and then uh he said, I've got one here if you want it. I said, yes, I do want it for $50. I'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> the only one. Other, other than getting stuff from, uh, there's plenty of them in Europe, still around Sweden. There's some in Alaska, North America, England, Scotland. Uh, this little field about over there. Surprisingly large numbers of them. Yeah, okay. Considering the life. This one. Well, they're yeah, aluminium, aren't they? Mostly aluminium. We've got a steel chassis with a timber floor. Yeah, uh, All okay. aluminium panels. Timber floor? Yep. Just a particle board for a particle and Arctic is fairly, fairly uh, hard on vehicles. They have what's called Sestrigi ice, which is um, can be up to a, uh, a foot high, but you can't see it through the soft snow. So they'll be driving along in anything, doing 20, 30 kilometres an hour, and be like hitting a gutter. So that, that a lot of the damage that's been done on it over the time that it was down there has been repaired down there, and I've left it how it is. Other than painting it, I haven't fixed a weld, I haven't replaced anything that. Uh, the, the no, it keeps it yeah. keeps all the, all the history exactly. with it, and yep. I think you were saying earlier just on the tracks here, on the axle, yep. on this front buggy here. There's a this whole buggy pin or pivot there has been replaced. It's still got the splines from the truck axle that's been replaced. I've got field notes from about 1963 stating when it happened and how it happened. So uh, to actually have that still there is, is pretty amazing. And these are all the original, all the original wheels, tires. And tires. Wheels. Yep, yep. Even that top one, which looks like a wheelbarrow wheel, they're all made by Trolleyborg in Sweden. All the bearings are Swedish. They had a fair industry going on over there. Yeah, they did, didn't they? Shock absorbers have been replaced. They're all bent or missing. Yeah. Apart from that, they're, they're standard Volkswagen shock absorbers. Sorry, standard. <laughs> sorry, standard Beetle shock absorbers. Yeah, exactly. I oh, know. They they it's used hard. apparently Snowtrack used to go to Volkswagen and say what parts don't you want anymore, and Volkswagen would have heap of superseded motors or steering wheels or whatever, and they'd take them as many as they needed. And that's why a lot of Volkswagen componentry on there. The gearbox is uh, a split case box. Yeah. With solid axles. A bit like someone told me it was a bit like uh, the Tempo Matadors had a similar sort of a solid oh. axle. I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Though. You say that, and I'm a big fan of Tempos. <laughs> we won't talk about that too much, but um, uh, we've uh, we've got a Tempo ourselves that we're going to restore. And these, um, all Terrible. these welds here, terrible, terrible welds. However, field work. Yes. Because I guess when you're in Antarctica and you're broken down, uh, the quality of your welds. Is probably the least of the thing on your mind when you're trying not to freeze to death. I don't, I don't, it's all part of the history. It's had a, 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 an amazing life in the six years in Antarctica and then it came back to Australia and had a, another whole career here up in the high country. So uh, it'd be a shame to touch everything that I have had to replace, which is not much. I've kept it all just so that it's all sorts together. So we'll go through the paint here because it's had a couple of lives. It is. Bless it. Um, and uh, there's a bit of mixture of uh, paint on here, but I think uh, keeping it keeping it as it is keeps all the 
you never paint it. Yeah, that's it. The, this is a car that you would never paint. Look, I've had I've had advice. Alan Hamilton told me a story about how the Porsche Museum in in, in Germany over restored some of their race cars and they regretted. He said, whatever you do, don't over restore it. The mechanical part had to be done. It was in such poor condition there was no getting around that. The body, I've just given it a quick rub back and left it as it is. Replaced a few panels that weren't. There was a couple of missing panels from the front, so yep. I've replaced them. Apart from that, it is how it came to me. Yeah, because uh, I'd imagine the the front took a bit of a yeah, a pounding at some the point. Was gone, the skid plate was gone. The bumper was gone. Both these mud guards were bent up to about here. Oh, they'd, they'd wow. been, this is the Sistrugi ice, which is a, a, a killer. A killer. So it, it stayed as far as I can tell till about 1966 in Antarctica and then was returned to Australia and sold at government auctions. It was bought by someone whose initials are M. Lucas, which are written on the back. Uh, went up to the high country, was towing, I've got actually video footage of it from the National Film and Sand Archive of it, of this machine towing skiers up the mountains up there. So they repainted it, it had been repainted orange in Antarctica, and yeah. I'd say they've given it another coat. You can see the original red through the bottom. There's an orange there, and then there's another orange on top. Uh, the engine bay was green when I got it for some reason. Oh, green? Green, yeah. Barrakee, which is a ski lodge, is still in operation now up in the high country. So it wasn't owned by Barrakee, but they have customers who re remember it, who recollect it. Mike's uh, Monster. Mike's Monster on the front there, and Mike was the M in M and D Lucas, which you'll see in the back. On the side here, that's the remnants of the original number two from Antarctica from, from the early 60s. What's this for? That's the, it's got an EBUS batch of petrol heater inside it. Oh, the, has it? That's the external fuel tank for that. Oh, so that's for the petrol <laughs> heater. Is, yeah. I'll tell you what, you don't want to be hitting too much ice with a petrol rod. Well, it's, got, yeah. a, it's got a, a valve in there so you can light the petrol heater, preheat the engine. That's why the fan shroud's got a little gap on the top there for a hose to run in there, which okay. is not there at the moment. So you can get the petrol heater going, preheat your motor, start it, and flip it flip the gate and warm the cabin up as well. Yeah, because although they're air cool, they don't want to be Antarctic no, cool. No, exactly. And that's the air intake for the petrol heater. Ah, uh, so okay. So it's hollow at the bottom. Oh, is it? Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. So back in the, when it went up to... It, that's when, pretty cool. When it first came to Australia, it would have had Porsche powered snow track written along there. Which yeah. Which may, may still be there. I haven't quite got to that. When they've repainted it, they've repainted it on the roof. On both sides. They would have been black initially, but now they've gone blue. Someone's painted blue along the sides. Bit of advertising for Alpenhorn Ski Lodge on the yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is very cool. I believe that's still there as well. On the back, we've got, I believe that's M and D Lucas, going cracking back 432, Mount Krakenback's up there near um, Perisher, that way. Yeah. Fashions on the field in the snow fields in the 60s oh, I and love 70s. That, that is, is really cool. cool. And Barrakee again down the bottom. Yeah, that door, like if this wasn't around, the door is something that you exactly. hang on a wall. Yeah, wouldn't it? And on this side, we've got again Porsche powered snow track on the roof. And down the bottom, a bit hard to read, that actually says Go Threadbow Snow Toe. Go Threadbow Snow Toe. In the, in the original, uh, film and sound archives footage you can actually even see all that and see the writing on the back so that's what identifies the footage film the uh, archive film sorry that's this machine it's in great condition considering its life yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah. but the real and you'll as Scott said we might sort of show some photos later but this mark here is the evidence that I found initially of that and some marks down there we're under layers of paint and from photos I've got from 1963-64 from Antarctica with exactly the same marks in exactly the same spots is what first let me know that this was one of those first two machines. And yeah, we there. will definitely insert some of that old yeah. footage and some of the old photos because um, yeah, this is um, what, what, a, what a gem. So we'll take a look on the inside as well. Sure. Season, a journey by snowcat to nearby Mount Kosciuszko is one of scenic and historic interest. 
Kosciuszko was Australia's highest mountain and was named by the explorer and scientist Sir Paul. So we're inside. So what was it like when you got it? Uh, when I first went to pick it up in South Australia, it was full of engine blocks and corrugated iron and bull bars and you name it, anything that all the crap that gets left on a farm was inside yep. it. Yep. No interior at all. The steering wheel was there. No seats. The roof was off. Might try and creep in. It's not a bad place to be. So, as we talked about earlier, there's the heating system. Yeah, it looks a bit of a death trap, but I guess when you're freezing to death, that, that's probably your lifesaver. It's not a bad place to be, is it? Seat 7, believe it or not. And I've got uh, field notes from Ando to get a, people talking about sleeping in it. Oh. Which is amazing. So there's all the dials. The steering wheels, it's similar to a World War II people wagon, swim wagon wheels. Um, yeah. But also some of the industrial stuff. I'm not 100% sure the era, but being at 58 snow track, it's. Yeah, if it, it, I've looked at swim wagon steering wheels and it's, I can't pick a difference in them. Whether it's a World War II steering wheel or not, I don't know, but it's pretty cool and I'm glad it's still there. Yeah, absolutely. Got the little plaque above the steering wheel to tell you not to turn the steering wheel. Things like that. Yeah. Um, a good mate of mine, Neville Gilbert, did all the wiring for it. He's been right through and done a pretty good job. The roof hatch was missing. I had to skin the roof. It's got uh, insulation in there and just timber. Uh, all the roof hatch was missing. So I had to sort of guess what a handle would look like to lift, yeah. it, to lift that up. Wow. Just, and then trying to sleep in this thing. <laughs> like, you've got to be stuck somewhere that this yeah. is your best option. Yeah, you have a read of these notes later, you'll, uh, you'll see how. It's, the, the history of our nature care of exploration down there is just amazing. And uh, before snow tracks got there, they, had, they used dog sleds right up to yep. 1981. They had Studebaker weasels, which were an ex-military thing. I think they weighed about seven tons, so that limited where they could drive to because of the ice crevasses and things like that. Um, so they really only had dog sleds to go long distance. So when snow tracks first arrived in 60, uh, they suddenly opened up Ant Antarctica to exploration, so the scientists could go a lot further um, and, and a lot safer too. They could drive over you know, ice bridges and things that they didn't even know were under there but would have collapsed a, a dozer or a or a weasel. Yeah. So really, the, the, the history of having these down there sort of changed the room. Yeah, because even just like the old piece of wood yep. under there. Same under the fuel tank here, there was lots of wood holding that up and uh, you know, replacing that fell with bits of course. And that's the original fuel tank, the original I guess. The original tank, I've had to put a new centre in it. I put a kit through it, but yep. it didn't last. So I've cut the side out, built a whole new tank inside it and put it all back together so you can't tell. That? Is actually a really good idea. It works. <laughs> so you take if I take that strap off, slide it out, the whole other side is open. It's got a whole new tank with a baffle in it. The original next welder to that tank just slots in. I really like that because you keep the originality. Yeah. However, you're not, yeah, you're not peeing fuel everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put a poor 15 kit through it. Didn't work. I didn't follow it by the book, and it just uh, it all flaked off. Yeah. So it, was, it, it wasn't terrible, but obviously not too bad to repair. It's actually a really nice place to be. In uh, later ones, and, uh, Hamilton Porsche imported about 30 of them over the years. Not all of them went through the Antarctic Division. A lot went to uh, the SEC and the relevant power companies up in the high country. There's a couple at uh, some of the hotels up there had for towing skis around, but they ended up uh, going through Recar in Melbourne and they had new cabins made for them, had a forward sloping windscreen, so they gave them a little bit more room inside. Because you try and get in the driver's seat, it is the most cramped seat you'll get into. Yeah, it, it does look, <laughs> it, it's a small seat. Well, the seats, are, I had to remake the seat, the seat was missing too. So yeah, made, made but there's not a lot of space and of course, you know, yeah. all of this around it. Like there's not a... Forward a fraction too when I pull it back in. Yeah, there's not a lot of space. These are all, again, these are aluminium <laughs> frames on the seats, all fixed to the body. The, uh, this part doesn't come off, of course. Oh, so that was all still here, yeah, all that, originally. Yeah. Yep, wow. we just said all the padding has been redone, paint obviously. She is amazing. I've left, left the dashboard and left the front paint as it was. Mm. 
So this, that's the old Beetle that you that's were talking about. Down in now I know the light is yep. on there, but we'll... Uh, it's a bit hard to see there. That scrap mark there is the mark that's still in the paint today. I think we might be able to pick that up. Yeah. I'll send you through the, the original pictures anyway, you might be able to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there it is again there. That's how it was when I bought it, and I saw there's a mark under there, which will match this one in the photo. So before I sanded it, I photographed the mark. Once I sanded it, you can actually see there. Oh, uh, yeah. So there's some photos of it with all the... So that's how it was when you first... Yeah, inside, looked, yeah. The wow. Front, you can see the front was quite bent up. Yeah. That is the old beetle that was with it as well for a long time. Wow. Tracks, there's the roof lining amongst all the salt bush over in South Australia. The tracks were in such poor condition and we cut them up with an axe to get them into the trailer. They're quite heavy. Yeah, because you were saying they're about seven metres long. Seven metres long each one. Yep, yeah, there's 960 bolts in the two tracks. No, I don't know. It's just like 500 bucks to go buy all that stuff. Uh, these photos over here. The number two is what, now that I know that it's number two, when that in a clearer photo of that, you can actually see the number two on this one at the back there. Yeah, okay. This one here, which is stuck in an ice crevasse, it's got the number two on it again. It's the same vehicle stuck in the ice crevasse. They've popped the roof hatch open to get out there because the back door's obviously not going to open when it's like that. Stop, yeah. This one here, I know that's mine because the Beatles there, which was only there in 63 for a year. By this time, the, the other snow track had been returned to Australia, so I know that's mine. And that one, I, I'm hoping it is, I can't tell. Again, you can see the number two on this one. There's a weasel there that has stripped the timing gear on the, on the uh, engine. So the snow track, which is number two, is towing that back to Mawson Station. Wow, what history. A couple of photos down there. The Beatles. Yeah, that Beatles lived a hard life. Oh, yeah. You see it in that photo up here, the, it's got a big dent in the hubcap there. That's about the only damage, but it's obviously had a lot more damage than that by the time it was returned to Australia. Yeah, because Beetle floor pans can get a little bit rusty at the best of times, never mind uh, <laughs> stuck in Antarctica. Yeah. So this photo here that we put up on the screen, th you're saying this is the first day this they is day though. This is at Mawson Station in Antarctica. You can't see any snow there. It's just rock, but there is a bit of both. Yep. Number one and number two, and the, I believe that's right that way because this one has a Porsche badge on that pillar. Yep. Back in those days, they would have pinned them on and not glued them on. And this one doesn't have the Porsche badge and there's no holes in mine. So I believe based on that, that's number one, that's number two. Yep. And that's mine there. So this photo shows your number two yes. and the the old Beetle as well. The Beetle is a, a Russian cargo plane in the background of this photo as well, which is still down there. It uh, came and went a few times and eventually uh, in a blizzard it got blown into a crevasse and was lost. So I'm sure that pilot's in the salt mine still somewhere. <laughs> he would have oh. been uh, reprimanded for that. It's a pretty good photo in that it's got the snow track at the front. It's got the Beetle, which was only there for a year. The Russian cargo plane, it's got a Studebaker weasel in the background, which is what they were using before the snow tracks. Yep. They did continue to use them. Bit of a fuel supply, obviously, they're getting drums in. Uh, the mountains in the background are called Rumdoodle Mountains, or Rumdoodle Airstrip, which is where this was, which is, I think, about 30 kilometres from Mawson Station. So this is, this is the day of pulling it out in Picking South it Australia. Up, yeah. it, look, it ended up in in uh, near uh, Barmera in South Australia, middle of nowhere, for a snow track. Probably the, the most polar opposite place a snow track could go to from where it was designed for. <laughs> uh, the old fellow that bought it from New South Wales took it over there and drove it up and down his driveway a few times and then parked it. And I think he, he probably broke a belt or something like that, broke a drive belt. And that was it. And then he passed she away. She stayed where she stopped. It did pretty much. Yeah, there was a bit of other, some Subarus and things like that lying around with it. And uh, he passed away. So his family sold it. So here's a picture of how the engine was when you first got it. Because you got it six months after you yep, got the, uh, the, the snow, snow track. track. Yep. The fellow, he rang me and he said, I found that engine if you still want it. And I said, I'm still thinking it's a Volkswagen engine this time. I had no idea there were Porsche engines in them. Yeah. And these ones. So I went over there, he said to me, actually no, to tell a lie there, I, I think I had discovered that it was a Porsche powered one because I'd seen the writing, that's right. Oh, the Correct. writing, yeah. 
Uh, so but I was you never know what engine's no, going to turn and up. I, though, I yeah. thought he won't know whether it's a Volkswagen motor or a Porsche motor or what. So anyway, I went over there pretty much straight away to South Australia. It's about eight or ten hours from here. Yep. Got there. It was a, a Porsche motor, a 356 engine. It is the original one. Uh, it was just a block, which looked to be pretty rough and pretty dirty. But she, she we found all the, <laughs> all the bolt-on parts. We found most of them outside of the, this old fellow's shed under a tree in the leaf litter, all rusty. So I brought it home, popped the rocker covers off just to have a look. It was turning over smoothly. I took the rocker covers off. and Because that's it, amazing how that, it, what that looks like underneath the rocker cover. Yeah, I was gobsmacked how clean it was. Yeah. And I thought this is going to be a put a carby on it and get it running, but it wasn't quite that easy. Well, we really hope you enjoyed that video. Um, it was a privilege for us to go and record it and go see that snow track. With the history and what people did back in the 60s in the Antarctic, it was absolutely amazing to go see it. Actually took a couple of days for it to sink in about what we'd really seen. So really appreciate that, Glenn. Absolutely fantastic. Please give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Loads more content coming soon. We'll see you later, guys. Have a great day.